friend Marky died of cancer and I cried. I'd spent my life doing sin, but I'd never told my friend anything about Zen. So I wrote Marky a letter, and it made me feel a little better. I wrote some more, I wrote letters by the score, and these are my letters to a dead friend about Zen. Letters to a Dead Friend About Zen. Today's podcast was recorded on July 4th, 2019 in London, England. We depend on your donations to support this podcast. To donate, go to hardcorezen.info slash donate. That's hardcorezen.info slash donate. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's really a pleasure to see everybody. I have a new book that is coming out in October from New World Library. And... Uh, it will be called Letters to a Dead Friend About Zen. The premise of the book is, in 2014, I was doing a tour of Europe, much like I'm doing right now. And it's something I've done since 2009. But uh, this one was uh, unique, uh, if unique is the word for it, in that uh, two friends of mine back home, two people that I had known since high school, were both uh, dying of cancer as I was traveling. And both of these people had strong connections to me in the, the punk scene that I was part of. If, if Some of you, I'm sure, know my story and some of you might not. But I got into Zen when I was the bass player of a hardcore punk rock band in Akron, Ohio called Zero Defects. And I had seen a lot of connections between the sort of punk rock ethos or, or whatever you call it, the, the philosophy and way of life that punk was sort of embracing and doing, and the Zen way of life and the Zen philosophy, although they are not the same at all. So both of these people were uh, involved in the early days of my punk rock things. Uh, one of them had been the drummer for the first ever band I put together in high school. The other person was a friend of mine who was also part of the punk scene. He was from the same, he went to the same high school as me, like the, both of these people did. And he'd been in a, another band and we had shared a house for a little while, for I think a year or possibly two years, we lived in the same house and we just kind of had known each other for, for a long time. And he was the one I was more closely in contact of the two of these people. Who were, who were both uh, dying at the time. So I was in contact with this uh, one guy uh, throughout the tour, and I'd visited him a couple of times during his illness. And during those times, like of course I have been working on what Zen people call the great matter of life and death, in inverted commas as you say over here, for, you know, the most of my life, you know, most of the time I had known him, in fact. I had been working on this thing, and here he was dying, and it's sort of, we never had a conversation about it, even though we, we spent two different weeks together where I just went and stayed at his, his house. Uh, so I was with him, you know, most of the day, every day for a week at a time, two different times. And yet, with all that opportunity, we'd never talked about the great matter of life and death or any of these things I had been working on, that maybe a person who knew that he was going to die very soon might have been interested in. But, you know, if I'm ever dying of cancer, the last thing I would want would be for somebody to tell me about their religion. So uh, I didn't want to put that burden on a close friend of mine, you know, to, to, start, to start getting all evangelical on him or anything, or even sound like I was. So I was sort of waiting to see if he wanted to talk about these things and, and thinking, well, maybe we'll get into it eventually. 
but it never happened uh, during either of these times I visited him or in any of the emails that I was having with him at, later on as I was traveling through Europe. It was all very sort of the same kind of things we'd always talked about, you know, bands and movies and whatnot, the kind of things, you know, people talk about. And when I was running a retreat or leading a retreat in a place called Benedictushof in Germany, in, uh, in Bavaria, I noticed that I wasn't getting replies from, from him anymore. And I thought, well, that's not a good sign because he'd been replying to me pretty consistently up till then. Then somebody uh, got a hold of me, one of his friends, uh, and said, yeah, they didn't think he was going to make it for long. He was in the hospital and his condition had become, had taken a real turn for the worse, as everybody sort of knew was going to happen one of these days. And I traveled, I think I did one more event in Bonn, if I'm getting the chronology right. And then I arrived in Hamburg and I got an email from a friend of his who said uh, he, he died. So I just kind of excused myself from the people who were hosting me and just wandered around. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, I remember it was drizzling that night and it was sort of, it was sort of cold. And I ended up in a pizza shop called Pizza Paza. And I'd been keeping this diary as I traveled, which I do every time I travel. And I sat in that pizza shop and I wrote this entry uh, for, the, for that day in my diary as if, it, as if I was addressing it to him, as if I was addressing it to my friend who just died and trying to sort of put down all my feelings as if, as if he could somehow magically read this thing. It was almost like a letter, hence the title of the book. Um, and and I, I did that, and I, I, of course, thought about him all through the rest of the, the tour and the rest of the time I was in Europe. And so... Uh, my life went on for the next couple of years, and I put out a couple of other books. One was called Don't Be a Jerk, and one was called It Came From Beyond Zen, and they were both sort of deep dives into the philosophy of Dogen, who was the 13th century Zen teacher who founded the sect of Zen that I study and practice in and have been doing so for the last few years, the last bunch of years, 30-some years. And... Then it sort of came time for another book, and I thought about the fact that I'd been traveling a lot and talking to people about these deep sort of Dogen things that were... I, I tried to keep them from being too intellectual, but it was very deep sort of Buddhist philosophy. And noticing that a lot of people in a lot of the audiences I was talking to well, they didn't even know who Buddha was, <laughs> you know? So I'm talking to them about Dogen uh, to, I'm talking about Dogen to people who don't, who, who are not even sure who Buddha was or what he was all about. So I thought, well, for this next book, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull back a little bit and and get more into basics, you know. And I sold my publishers on the idea of putting out a book called Zen 101. This was the first proposal I sent them. That was going to be like basic Zen, just kind of laying out the basics and not and not doing all this deep Dogen stuff. But as I was writing Zen 101, I, I just became frustrated and bored with it. Uh, I, I just, it was, you know, I, it's sort of, after a while, these things become second nature and, and talking about the, the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path and who Bodhidharma was and all of this stuff in sort of a generalized way to a, 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 an imaginary generalized audience just wasn't doing anything for me at all. And, and I'm one of those people that I, I can't really write unless the writing itself is interesting to me. Like, if it's not interesting to me, it, I don't th see why it's going to be interesting to anyone else. And looking for inspiration, I started just leafing through these old diaries I'd kept while traveling, thinking, well, maybe that'll spark something. And I came across uh, that entry that I'd written to my friend after he died. And I thought, well, what about that? What about instead of writing to an imaginary audience all these things about basic Buddhism, which seem sort of dry and academic and I can't put any life into them, what if I, I say all the things to my friend that I would want to have, to have had conversations about when he was dying? You know, these, 
these kind of, because that's what got me into Zen Buddhism, was because it addressed these very deep, very real sort of concerns that I think all people share. And I certainly shared them. And I was certainly interested in the great matter of life and death when I started doing Zazen. So I took a lot of the topics that I had, uh, had been working on for this Zen 101 book and turned them into letters, a series of letters written as if they are coming from different, uh, different venues that I'm going, that I'm traveling around in Europe. Uh, during, well, first I tried to constrain it to that 2014 tour for, for authenticity's sake, but I realized that I, if I pulled some things from other tours of Europe I'd done, uh, it would be a much more interesting book, like, uh, like the time when I was in Germany and I had to get a spinal tap at a German hospital. <laughs> that, that's sort of an interesting story. Didn't happen on that particular tour. Um, you know, different, different weird things that had happened to me while traveling around. So I took, I took all that stuff and I re wrote them as a series of, I think it ends up being 24 letters that I write to my friend. And I changed his name because at first I'd written it with his actual name, with the actual name of the person, the, the, the particular person who I'd been emailing. But then I thought, well, it should also be about that other friend of mine who also died that trip. And then it should also kind of address um, people, people I know from that punk scene who are, who are still alive. You know, I could kind of envision them as an audience. So I created kind of a composite character and gave him the name Marky Moon, which is actually the punk rock name of my friend Mark Smith. That's after the, some of you probably know, the uh, television's uh, first album. He, he, he was a drummer, and he, call, well, he still is a drummer, and he calls himself Marky Moon for his stage name. Uh, so I used his name. I asked him if it was okay, and he, he said fine and wrote all these letters to Marky, my, my dead friend. Um, so, that's the book. This particular evening, tonight, uh, I was asked by Alan to talk about beginner's mind, the concept of beginner's mind. And I'm always slow to come up with these ideas. Somewhere during this tour, I thought, well, why not just write another letter to Marky about beginner's mind. There's no letter in the book about it. Uh, it just didn't seem to come up about that specific subject, but I could write another one. And this sort of snowballed into the idea that I could just keep this going. I could keep this sort of, what do you call it, literary conceit, I guess would be a word for it, uh, going and, and just, uh, just continue it really without any particular limit because I can keep writing letters to, to Marky forever. So I wrote a letter to Marky about beginner's mind, and this sparked the idea that what if I just do a podcast, and I'll do a podcast in which I'll read a letter to Marky every week about some aspect of Zen or Buddhist practice that I think might be interesting. I'll start out at the Angel City Zen Center, which is a Zen center I established in Los Angeles, or I can't say I established it, but a group of us came together and put it, made it happen and I'll start off talking to them. But instead of maybe just starting off talking to them, I can start off talking to you. <laughs> so this is a bit of an experiment tonight. I have been traveling through Europe, uh, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, and Austria, this tour, reading chapters of the book to audiences in those countries. Some of them have been people who were on retreat with me. Some of them were situations more like this, where it's an invited audience who are, who are, who are coming to see me for a talk rather than, rather than doing any sort of Zen practice together with me. Uh, and I've been reading the letters, and the discussions have been good, the ones that have been based on the book. So this is what I'd like to do tonight. What I'd like to do first is read the letter that I've written to Marky, a new letter that won't be in the book and then see if we can get a discussion happening. And I'm recording it. So this, I'm hoping, will be... I don't know if it'll be the first episode of the podcast when it gets... when we finally start putting them out on iTunes and whatever we put them out on, Spotify and all that. Uh, it might not be the first one, but it is the first one I'm recording. So, uh, so you guys are the experimental test case. So here goes the letter. Dear Marky, I'm in London and it's Independence Day, the 4th of July, ID4. 
This is a funny place for an American to be on this day. I've spent a lot of fourths of Julys in foreign countries, in Kenya when I was a kid, and in Japan as an adult. But I've never spent a fourth of July in the very stronghold of the evil redcoats themselves. It feels a bit dangerous. Plus, I have to talk to a bunch of those redcoats about Buddhism tonight. I hope I make it through the evening intact, otherwise I might be seeing you very soon. Today I walked around Denmark Street, the place where the Sex Pistols used to rehearse. And I had a look at Morris Music, the shop that Pete Townsend used to steal guitars from in the early days of The Who. The bag of nails where all the great bands used to congregate is still here. You'd have liked London, Marky. I wish I could have shared it with you. Anyway, the Redcoats asked me to talk about the concept of beginner's mind tonight. I thought that might interest you, too, so I figured I'd write you a letter about it. One of the best books about Zen is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Shunryu Suzuki, first published in 1970. Suzuki was the first head of the San Francisco Zen Center. He was originally sent from Japan to San Francisco in 1959 to administer a small temple there called Sokoji that catered to the Japanese immigrant community in San Francisco. This just happened to also be the time when the beatnik generation was getting into Zen. They were highly influenced by the writings of another Suzuki, D.T. Suzuki, a scholar who had written many popular books about Zen. Years later, Shunryu Suzuki said of D.T. Suzuki, he is big Suzuki, I am little Suzuki. For most of the beatniks, the ability to quote cryptic quips from ancient Zen masters was little more than a fashion accessory to go with their black turtleneck sweaters and scratchy beards, same as it is with today's hipsters who like to say they're into Zen. But there were a few among the San Francisco beatnik crowd who were brave enough to go check out the actual Zen temple right in the heart of their very own city. Suzuki wasn't sure just what to make of these guys, but if they wanted to sit Zazen with him, he was happy to have the company. Not many members of the Japanese community attended early morning Zazen, preferring instead to skip Zazen and go to the chanting services later. After a while, a significant number of non-Japanese people became regulars at Sokoji. Within a few years, the non-Japanese people attending Zazen sittings and Suzuki's lectures outnumbered the Japanese congregation. Suzuki established a new, larger center about a mile down the road to accommodate them, and that was the San Francisco Zen Center. The book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind was assembled from transcripts of some of the earliest talks Suzuki gave to his new American students. When I was researching for my talk in London about beginner's mind, I decided to see what the internet had to say about the concept. My hosts here asked me where the term had originated and if it could be found in Dogen's writings. So I googled the Japanese word that Suzuki had translated as beginner's mind, which is shoshin. Good golly, it was trending. I had no idea that shoshin was a thing among American hipsters these days. It seems that earlier this year, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez went on Twitter and tweeted something about using the Shoshin approach to her gardening. This set off a wave of interest in Shoshin. You probably have no idea who Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is, Marky. Hopefully folks wherever you are don't pay attention to American politics. I'm sure most of the people at my London talk won't know her either. AOC, as the hipsters have dubbed her, is a newly elected member of Congress that the American media is crazy in love with. She's just so young and perky. Me, I'm not all that impressed with her. She seems like another overhyped politician as far as I'm concerned. But the fact that AOC, of all people, is tweeting about Shoshin is interesting. I'm not sure exactly where AOC came across the phrase Shoshin approach, but I found a whole bunch of business-related blogs that used the same phrase. 
One was titled, How the Shoshin Approach to Business Can Spur Innovative Solutions. Another was called, The Shoshin Approach to Trading. They all use the exact same quote from Suzuki, which goes, In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. This quote appears on the back cover of the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I skimmed over a few of these blogs, and none of them reference anything else from the vast literature of Zen Buddhism. It's as if they not only didn't read anything about Zen, they apparently didn't even read any more of Suzuki's book than the back cover. All of their theories and advice derive solely from their own misinterpretations of that one quote. These theories and advice basically amount to think outside the box, but dressed up so as to sound all ancient and oriental. Because of AOC and these blogs, lots of people on the internet these days are tweeting and posting away about this fascinating ancient Zen concept of Shoshin, beginner's mind. Wikipedia even has an entry on the ancient Zen concept of Shoshin. Unfortunately for them, Shoshin isn't actually an ancient Zen concept. The word Shoshin is just the standard, everyday Japanese word for a beginner. For example, student drivers in Japan have to put a sticker on their cars that says Shoshin Untensha. Untensha means driver. Beginning level English courses are called Shoshinsha Ego, meaning beginner's English. Shoshin ni Modoru means back to the basics. Shunryu Suzuki noticed that the two Chinese characters that are used to spell out the Japanese word for beginner, Shoshin, literally mean begin and mind. Suzuki decided to take those Chinese characters literally. Dogen, the 13th century monk who founded the Soto sect of Zen Buddhism, did this a lot. The most famous example is what he did with the word uji, which just means sometimes. The two characters used to spell out uji literally mean being and time. Dogen spun this linguistic idiom into a brilliant essay on the nature of being and how it relates to time. Likewise, Shunryu Suzuki made use of another Japanese idiom and started literally translating the word shoshin for his American students as beginner's mind. Dogen used the word shoshin a lot, but he never split it up into its two characters to create a new meaning for the word. That was Shunryu Suzuki's innovation. So, rather than being an ancient Japanese Zen concept, beginner's mind was invented about 50 years ago by a Japanese Zen priest far from home trying to find ways to communicate to his new American students. And by the way, Suzuki didn't say shoshin or shoshin approach in his lectures. He used the English phrase beginner's mind. I'm not sure who started the trend of back translating beginner's mind into Japanese, but whoever it was clearly did not speak Japanese. Although the concept of beginner's mind is relatively new in terms of this way of articulating it, Zen has a long tradition of valuing beginners. In most areas of life, beginners, newbies, are looked upon with disdain and only experts with lots of experience are valued. In contrast, in his essay Zazenshin, A Needle for Zazen, Dogen says, Truly, we should know that a beginner's zazen is the first zazen, and the first zazen is the first sitting Buddha. In Bendoa, Practicing the Way, he says, Since this is the practice of enlightenment, the beginner's practice of the way itself is the whole of original enlightenment. In the same essay, he also says, A beginner's pursuit of the truth is just the whole body of the original state of experience. In all of these examples, the word translated as beginner is shoshin. Shunryu Suzuki's early students were some of the first people outside of Asia to seriously practice Zen Buddhism. They thought of themselves as merely rank beginners and imagined that the real Zen experts were in Japan. Suzuki was trying to let them know that their practice was just as valuable and as real as that of any seasoned Zen master or anyone who grew up in a country where everybody learns the basics of Buddhism from the time they're children. 
A lot of us Zenies in America, Europe, and elsewhere in the Wild West also feel like Zen amateurs and envy folks from the Far East. But we really shouldn't. Zen isn't about accumulating experience. It's about opening yourself to your own real state here and now, no matter what it is. We are reborn every instant. We are always beginners in this moment. In an essay called Jisho Zammai, The Samadhi of Experiencing the Self, Dogen says, we should just utilize our own beginner's state of learning and practice in order to experience communion with the beginner's state of learning and practice of the external world. He is cautioning his experienced monks to always remember the state they had when they first began their practice and to use that state to enable themselves to continually experience the newness of every moment. There's another reason that we beginners here in the West shouldn't envy experienced practitioners back East. It's very much related to Shunryu Suzuki's work in San Francisco and to my teacher Gudo Nishijima's work in translating Dogen into English. These two teachers, as well as many others in Asia, were concerned that Zen was dying in their countries. Too often in Japan, for example, people only meditate as a kind of training in order to become temple priests. Not many people are interested in Zazen for its own sake. People like Suzuki and Nishijima liked teaching Westerners because Westerners didn't see Zazen as a pathway to a career. They liked the way their Western students could see Buddhism with fresh eyes in ways that people in their own countries could not. One of my greatest concerns is that we Western Zenis are already starting to lose our beginner's mind, especially in America. Too much of American Zen is involved in politics, both the politics of elected officials and the politics of who outranks who in the little bubble universe that is American Zen. Zen is being marketed as a commodity and its teachers are being sold as celebrities. The situation isn't quite the same, nor is it quite as advanced as the situation in Japan, but it took hundreds of years for Zen to devolve over there, whereas it's already starting to decay after just 50 years in America. I guess we Americans like to do everything fast. This is one of the reasons I'm spending my Independence Day in London talking to these redcoats. Buddhism reached Europe a bit later than it got to America. Over here, it's still as new as it was in America when Shunryu Suzuki got his start. I haven't given up hope in American Zen, though. It's still early days. We may be able to get things back on track in the U.S. if enough people are willing to make the effort. If we stop letting politicians and business people co-opt Zen for their own purposes and stop mucking about with things that have nothing to do with our practice, that is. I plan to keep on doing my part. So there you go, Marky. That's what beginner's mind is. I hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for stray pitchforks down there. Brad. The end. <laughs> oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I hope that got into most of what beginner's mind is, but I imagine people might have questions about it or about anything Zen-related or not Zen-related. We've been studying the group, we've been looking at Kaz Tanahashi's Moon yeah. in the Dewdrop. And what's quite interesting there is in Moon in the Dewdrop, Kaz Tanahashi translates things as beginner's mind. So oh, does he? It's feeding off itself. So oh. Shimura Suzuki, as you've said, it sort of kind of comes up with the term. Yeah. And now Kaz Tanahashi is writing it into Dogen. So in some yeah. of the translations in Gakadu Yojin Shu and Bodo Satishisho, he's using the term beginner's mind as if Dogen wrote that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because he just uses that word shoshin and that doesn't... He, he, like I said in the letter, he, he did do that with other words like Uji and, and there's probably a few other examples I could think of if I wasn't in front of a bunch of people on the stage. Um, but he, yeah, he, he does that a lot, but as far as I've been able to find, he, does, he never split Shoshin up into its component characters and made it into, a, into one of his phrases, like he did with other words. Um, and, the, and the idea of beginner's mind is, is trying to bring a freshness. My, my teacher, uh, Nishijima Roshi, 
would say things like zazen brings you back to the state of mind you had when you were a child uh, which was his way to express it. So children sort of see the world as continuously new. Well, you would know this, I'm sure. Some of you have children as well would know this. You know, everything's very exciting when you're a child. And we lose that as adults. And that's one of the purposes. I don't know if it's, if it's proper to say purpose. I just wanted to ask you about, um, let me call it the literary conceit of Brighton to your yeah. dead friend. And I wondered if you could talk more about um, um, more about how your relationship with your dead friend oh. outside of writing the letters. Uh, my brother died like two years ago. Okay. So it's um, you know interesting to think about what what you think or how you relate to people that you've lost. Yeah, how I relate to people I've lost in my relationship with my actual you know, dead friend who I was writing to. I guess what I was trying to ask. Was okay. Uh, now that he's dead, well. Because, like, it, like in the letter, you joke yeah. that he's, you know, in hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I know you don't believe that. Yeah. From what I know of your books, um, I don't think you believe he exists in any way whatsoever anymore. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's not that I don't believe he exists in any way whatsoever. And, and yeah, the, the stuff, the jokes about the pitchforks and all that is, I don't really believe he's in hell, but. I think that's where he would have preferred to be, you know, given the, you know, given the way they're both presented in pop culture. I, this, this gets into some areas which I do get into in the book about the sort of Buddhist idea of God and life after death is mostly open-ended. Um, I mean, you, there are different forms of Buddhism, so I'm sort of talking about the stream that I kind of came out of and in that sort of Soto Zen Buddhist stream, um, it's, it's open-ended. There isn't, a, there isn't a, a formula to say, well, this is what happens after you die. Like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, for example, gives out you know, the bardos and all these various things that are supposedly happen to the, to the person following death. Um, it, there's, there isn't any of that really. There's a, there's a small bit of it, we could argue, that exists in this Soto tradition, but it's not very important in the tradition. Personally, just to give you what, what, for what good my experience has, uh, has, is good for, I, th there have been experiences that I've had related to my Zen practice in which it, it felt very real as if something had opened up and for a fleeting moment here and there, I was granted an opportunity to see very dimly how things really work. That's the best way I can put it. And it's not, you know, people talk about enlightenment experiences and, and you know, the way it's sort of presented is as if you, you suddenly understand it all. My, my experience with experiences like that is not like that, but it is a bit like, as one of the ways I've been trying to describe it lately is, is some, you know, somebody opens a curtain and goes, here's what's behind the curtain, okay, <laughs> you know, and you go, wait, wait a minute, there's stuff behind that curtain and I saw some of it, and you go, and they go, yeah, yeah, that's all you get, <laughs> and you just get this one look. But that one look, or the few looks I've, I've had, which felt as real as any, you know, as real as any real experience I've ever had doing anything else, I used to try, I used to, the comparison I used to try out with audience was, audiences was it was like it was like as real as dropping a bowling ball on your foot. Like if you dropped a bowling ball on your foot 17 years ago, you'd know that you dropped a bowling ball on your foot 17 years ago. And anybody who tried to say, no, maybe you just imagined, you'd say, no, I didn't imagine that. I dropped a bowling ball on my foot, you know, for sure. And I still have this crippled toe. You know, that's the way I feel about it. Um, and so from those experiences, came the, the feeling that w what I thought of as my individual consciousness was not something that belonged to me. And, and that this didn't apply to just to me, but applied to all of us. Uh, that, that, that our experiential, the experiential side of our, our existence isn't something, we, we sort of grow up, I don't know about all of you, but 
I sort of grew up thinking that my, my experiential, the experiential side of my life was something that was mine and mine alone, could never be shared, uh, and, you know, it was, it, was, it was solely individualized, you know, it was just me. Uh, you know, other things I might share with other people, but that I couldn't share. I could tell them about it maybe and they could relate to it, but it was, it was mine and mine alone. Those moments of kind of opening up, one of the things that was very clear in those moments and has been very clear in every one of them was that this wasn't, that wasn't the case at all. That this individual uh, experience that I'm having, this, this profoundly, deeply individual experience, was not my individual experience. It was something that, f the best way I can sort of describe it is something I, I act as a filter for, <laughs> you know, for, for something much larger that is probably making its own use of these experiences, these billions and billions of experiences that it you know, is gathering or, or experiencing, or I don't know what it's doing with them. And so in that sense, those two friends of mine who died, they're, they're still part of it. You know, it, it, the, the, the individual parts of that experience don't go away once someone dies. I don't know if, uh, he, if well, let, let's use the name Marky, uh, but I don't know if Marky is still there. Um, experiencing things as Marky. So I don't feel like he's, he's disappeared from the universe, but um, what exactly happened to him or what exactly will happen to any of us when that happens, I really honestly do not know, you know. Um, I've read the literature in, in Buddhism and other traditions that says what they think happened, and I go, eh, I don't know, maybe that happens. <laughs> You know? If you could have an email from your dead friend, what do you reckon? If I could have an email if, with, yeah, with him, from, with my dead friend? <laughs> beyond the grave. <laughs> uh, what do you reckon he's saying in, um, in, uh, about in a book written to him? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, get, knowing the kind of person he was, he'd probably be, be slightly embarrassed by the whole thing. You know, he'd probably, he'd probably be happy that I chose not to use his real name. You know, I, there's a lot of questions. I, I love to ask somebody about life after death, you know, whether there is such a thing or anything. But I don't know. I, I, I hope he would appreciate the effort and, the, and, and what I was trying to do. And, and I really wish I could have had these conversations with him. You know, it's, 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 it's honestly things I wish I could have said to him. I don't know how he'd feel. Do you think that there's something potentially quite frightening about a uh, beginner's mind? In mm. the sense that, you know, we all tend to invest an awful lot of like our energies in really sort of looking and feeling like we know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I think there is something kind of frightening about beginner's mind because we do, as you say, invest a lot of energy into knowing something you know you want to be the expert in in something you know you want to you want to be able to tell i've been very proud because my girlfriend's come come with me and this first time i've had somebody uh, come come with me in europe and i've been able to tell her oh yeah this is the <laughs> you go around the corner here and there's this thing you know because i'm like ah i know about I, I know a few things in london i know a few things in amsterdam so um because i've been here a lot so yeah, being, being knowledgeable, being an expert in something is very valuable in our society. So I think for a lot of people, um, putting that aside is a bit scary because you, you do have to come into, if you're going to do a Zen style meditation practice, you know, what you're supposed to do is each time you, put your, you sit yourself down on the cushion and start doing your Zazen, you're supposed to just put yourself back into the mind of, of the first time you ever did it, you know, as, as much as possible, and not worry about an accumulation of expertise or an accumulation of experience or an advancement in levels, you know. That's very, uh, it's, it's very tricky because I, I, I see a lot of, even very old established traditional meditation systems will get into things where they where they start ranking people you know who's the who's the best meditator and who's you know who's had you know who's reached level you know whatever it is and 
the Zen tradition is to, is to get rid of all of that. It actually is a little bit of a contentious thing uh, within Buddhism, how, how much the Zen tradition does that. And I think a lot of other forms of Buddhism look upon Zen with a bit of suspicion because it says, no, there's no, there's no levels, there's nothing, there's no point at which uh, you, you become a... Um, I mean, we do use the word Zen master occasionally, but most teachers I know who reject that term, it's something somebody else can call you if they really want to, you know, I don't know, kiss your ass or something. But, um, but, um, but it's, not, it's not something anybody worthwhile would call themselves, I don't think. Uh, so you're trying, to, you're trying to pare it down to that. And yeah, so, so you have to be, you have to have that innocence and it can be a bit, you know, you're, you're giving up all your props and all your, the things that you've, you've invested a lot in yourself, you know, your own personality, your own identity doesn't matter. You've, you've worked, you know, for 20, 30, 50 years of establishing a personal ident identity and you get into this practice in which your personal identity is worthless, you know, absolutely worthless. And no matter who you think you are, the practice is going to be the same uh, for you. At the same time, it, 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 there's, that, the, there's that frightening aspect, but it's also very freeing because you don't, you don't have to know anything. You know, that's one of the things I found very exciting initially about the Zen tradition was that I didn't need to know anything about it. You know, I could, I could sit Zazen from the very first day and it was completely valid. It didn't, it didn't matter that I'd never done it before or that I didn't know what I was doing. In fact, not knowing what you're doing is a good thing in Zen. Because once you know what you're doing, then you know, you've kind of lost the plot, you know, ironically. Can you talk about the relationship between emotion and Zen? Because one of the thing that, things that concerns me, or it's probably a misunderstanding of mine, is that Zen is supposed to make you like, chilled out, or not uh, feel passionate emotions, or not have preferences. And I think that, yeah. for example, like, I don't want my dad to die. And yeah. I wouldn't want to not. No, want no, to that's a normal. Yeah. So is that yeah, like it's, well, a normal? Okay. You know it's a common misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding I've held myself at times during my study of this that, that Zen is su you're supposed to be detached from your feelings or supposed to not feel emotions or supposed to feel very, you know, chill and even. And it's not really that. I, I think more, more what if you're supposed to do anything, that's the problem, the supposed to is sort of gets in the way. But I think it's, to, it's, it's taking an honest approach to the feelings that you actually have. You know, so, so rather than trying not to have those feelings or trying to reach a state where you don't have those feelings, it's, it's more a, a matter of letting those feelings be as they actually are without adding to them or without trying to deny them or, or, or trying to avoid them. The, the, one of the problems is that word attachment, which is often used in translations of Buddhist literature, specifically in other Eastern religions in general. And I really can't, I can't remember the Sanskrit word, but somebody recently pointed out to me, and I looked it up and he was right, that the word, the Sanskrit word that's usually translated as attachment actually means something more like fuel. And the image that they're trying to invoke is don't add more fuel to the emotions that you already have, um, which, which we tend to do all the time. If you have, if you're angry, uh, the, the tendency for a lot of us, I know this from my own experience, is to, is to mentally add up all the things that you have to be angry about and thereby, you know, throw a bunch more fuel onto the anger that you already have and make it bigger anger. You know, sadness can work the same way. You know, people, we don't, we don't realize it, but we often do this with, with sadness. You'll just, you'll pile sadness upon sadness and, and you'll have a mountain of sadness. And, 
and what they're talking about, what the Buddhists were talking about in terms of what's been translated as non-attachment to English-speaking audiences is more like don't add more to the emotion than is already there, but the emotion that is already there, experience it fully, you know, have the full experience of the emotion as long as the emotion is there and then also be able to let it go when, when it's no longer necessary or when, it's, when you're no longer feeling it. I mean, I, I know I do this myself. I'll hold on to emotions that I'm not actually feeling anymore. I've, found, I've spotted myself doing this so many times. Um, I'm not actually angry at that person anymore, but I'm supposed to be still angry at him, so I'll be, you know, holding on to the anger. You know, or I'm not actually sad about that thing anymore, and, but I'm supposed to be sad, so I'm trying to make myself sad about it, or whatever it happens to be. So it's not that you're trying to push away your emotions, but more trying to allow the emotion to be exactly what it is uh, without any more or any less than it has to be. I've met a lot of Buddhists that freak me out because they're just like flat. And sure. Really freaky people to talk to, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that I'm not. I, I don't want to be like that, but I see a culture of oh, people yeah. being like. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't know, saintly, or I don't know, just weird. So well, there is. No, no, I, no, I'll, I'll, and, and yeah, I can speak to that too, because <laughs> it's definitely true, and I've run into those those people at at Buddhist centers and and retreat centers, and I run into them all the time. And, and yeah, it, it, people imagine that that's what they're supposed to do and, they, and they're trying to, they, they create a persona for themselves that's perpetually cool and they freak me out just as much as they freak you out. I don't, I don't like hanging around with people like that. It, they, it really bugs me. And, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be a person who encourages others to do that. So I'm, you know, I always find myself speaking out about that particular tendency that you'll see. I just think it's an unfortunate tendency uh, among people who, who consider themselves to be Buddhists, um, but I don't think it's real. Uh, I'm um, coming from the Theravada Buddhist community myself. I can kind of hear some parallels between what you're talking about with Zen becoming this huge institution and everything. People are latching onto this beginner's mind as a product that can yeah, yeah. you know, heal everything. And, you know, and in a way, in the Theravada community, we're finding this, you know, this struggle between, like, we've got mindfulness, and then we've got loads of people saying, oh, yeah, mindfulness this, mindfulness that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mindfulness colouring, but for crying oh, out loud. Oh, God, now, is know, there one? So many things with mindful of this and that tagged on the beginning, and it's really annoying to the traditionalists who, who know the deep benefits of mindfulness practice, and are seeing it, it it's become, like, this um, marketing ploy. Yeah, sure, yeah. You know, um, but then on the other hand, I suppose it does take it out to the wider community, so people who have no knowledge of Buddhism, no knowledge of mindfulness, at least they're getting a little bit of a taste of it, and if, they, if they're interested, they can go a little bit deeper. So do you think there's maybe like the saving grace of you know, Zen becoming this huge gargantuan beast? You know? uh, do you think there's some, maybe a slight benefit in that sense? Well, it's a good, yeah, it's a good point. And I, yeah, I've, I've railed against mindfulness as a product for a long time and, and for the same reasons you, you kind of pointed out. But yeah, there is, there is some benefit. I feel like it's, you know, it's becoming part of the culture and, that, and that's a good thing. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing that, that schools and, you know, hospitals and people like that, to mental health people are getting interested in mindfulness. It, that that's not a bad thing, and it does have some larger benefit to the culture. I think I think it's good though that that uh, for people, and I'm trying to be one of those people who kind of comes around and points out that yeah, well, that's not exactly mindfulness, or that's not exactly beginner's mind that you're you're talking about there. That's that's something a little different. But it does it does have some overall benefit, and I'm 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 happy to see it happen. I, a friend of mine, when I was making a documentary about the hardcore punk scene, a friend of mine who I was interviewing, who was part of the scene, said, "Yeah, he said the difference these days is there is a the, when we started out there was no sort of commercial." 
punk scene, but now there is. But yet, the, the authentic sort of punk scene still exists alongside of it somehow, you know. And I think you can kind of compare that to, to this too, because there's that commercialized spirituality that doesn't really have that much effect. And what I worry is when that commercialized stuff starts to have an effect on the authentic stuff, you know. When they say, oh, we, start, we should start doing it like that. And I go, no, no, don't do it like that. That's, that's, that's how you ruin it. Yeah, thank you. We depend on your donations to support this podcast. To donate, go to hardcorezen.info slash donate. That's hardcorezen.info slash donate.